Let's imagine a scenario. You're idling at, say, 600 RPM, and then you decide to put the vehicle in gear and floor it. The butterfly valve inside your throttle body takes a fraction of a second to open fully and allow maximum air into the engine. It takes that air even less time to actually get into the engine into the combustion chamber. And then it takes the injectors another absolutely minuscule amount of time to deliver the fuel needed to match this air. So within a fraction of a second, we're giving the engine everything it needs to build maximum power. We're allowing maximum air into the engine and we can deliver maximum fuel instantly. So then why can't the engine deliver maximum power and maximum torque instantly. Why does it need to wrap to here and here to build peak torque and peak power? Why can't it build peak torque and peak power right after idle if we're giving it everything it needs to do so? Now I know we're accustomed to seeing power and torque as curves, but have you ever wondered why are they actually curved? So do you know the answer? Why is power and torque a curved and not a flat line? Well the answer might be both surprising and kind of obvious, and the answer is Piston speed. Why piston speed? Because a fully open throttle valve may allow a lot of air to potentially get into the engine. But how much air actually gets into the engine is determined by the piston. Now I know a lot of you right now are going like, huh? What is this lunatic talking about? Piston speed? No, it's the intake valves. The size of the intake valves and how much they get opened, their lift, and the duration of how long they stay open, that's what determines how much air gets into the engine. Well, yes, this is technically true, but again, intake valves are just like the throttle body. A large intake valve gets opened a lot, has a lot of lift, and stays open for a long time, only creates potential for a lot of air to get into the engine. Again, how much air actually gets into the engine is determined by the speed of the piston. So how does this work? Well, it's actually pretty simple. When the piston moves down the bore, it creates a void, an absence of air, a vacuum. When a vacuum appears, air, of course, moves to fill that vacuum. And this vacuum, which is constantly being created by the piston as the engine is running, is the true source of the engine's appetite for air. Now, the higher the engine RPM, the faster the crankshaft rotates and the faster the piston travels down the bore. The faster the piston travels down the bore, the more vacuum it creates more rapidly. The more vacuum it creates, the more air rushes into the engine, the more air is being pulled into the engine. And this is the reason why power and torque are curves. At 700 RPM, there simply isn't enough piston speed to pull in a lot of air into the engine. You may open the throttle fully and create potential for a lot of air to get in, but a lot of air won't get in because there isn't enough piston speed. And this is why when you floor it from idle, nothing really happens. There's no drama until RPMs increase at least a bit. By the time the engine builds up, let's say 5000 RPM, the piston is traveling so fast that it can ingest the maximum possible air that the throttle body and intake valves will allow. You can match this with maximum fuel and create the maximum, you know, combustion power you can generate, which generates maximum combustion pressure and pushes the piston down with maximum power. And then using the connecting rod and crankshaft pin as a leverage, the piston can act on the crankshaft and the crankshaft spins with maximum torque. Now I know that again some of you are going, eh, who cares? This only applies to naturally aspirated engines because when it comes to forced induction we can use a turbo or supercharger to stuff in more air into the engine than a silly little vacuum could ever hope for. Well, yes, a supercharger and a turbo can increase the peak power output of an engine definitely, but the power and torque curves of forced induction engines are still curves. No conventional mass-produced forced induction device can create flat power and torque curves, nor can it generate instant power and torque right off idle. And this is of course because no turbo or supercharger can create boost at idle. A turbo needs heat and exhaust gases to be driven to create boost. A supercharger is directly connected to the crankshaft pulley, usually via a belt, and needs engine RPM to spin fast enough to create boost. 
at idle, neither is creating boost. And this means that, again, the initial combustion that creates exhaust gases and increases RPM and then drives the turbo or supercharger is, again, dependent on the vacuum generated by the piston speed, which draws in the air, creates the combustion, and then drives the turbo or supercharger. Piston speed and the vacuum which is generated by the downward piston movement is at the core of the internal combustion engine and as such it shapes the power and torque curves. Now it's time for the level 2 question. Why is peak torque always generated at a lower RPM than peak horsepower? Aren't torque and horsepower linked together? Isn't horsepower essentially torque times RPM? So if they're linked together, why don't the curves follow each other? Why don't they look similar or the same? Well, the answer to that question is in the question itself. The curves can't be the same because horsepower is torque times RPM. If you're using the horsepower formula, then horsepower equals torque in feet pound times RPM divided by 5252. If you're using kilowatts and the formula is torque in newton meters times RPM divided by 9549. But it doesn't matter which formula you're using, you can see that at the essence, at the core of the formula, torque is multiplied by RPM. So what do these two formulas tell us? Well, they tell us that it's simply impossible to have similar or identical horsepower and torque curves on the same graph and at the same scale. Why? Because both torque and RPM are a multiplier for horsepower. Let's use a dyno chart of an electric vehicle to demonstrate this nicely. In this case, it's a Tesla Model 3. And as you can see, because it has an electric motor, it can generate instant torque. An electric motor obviously doesn't care about piston speed and vacuum and whatnot. Uh, the battery supplied energy, the electric motor starts spinning, and voila, instant torque. And as you can see, the electric motor can also keep a flat torque curve for a pretty large chunk of its RPM band. But look at the horsepower curve. Although the torque curve is flat, the horsepower curve is increasing. It's rising again because RPM is a multiplier for horsepower. Here we're multiplying torque by 1000, here we're multiplying torque by 2000, here we're multiplying torque by 3000 and so on and so forth. Even if torque is flat, RPM is always increasing and it's a multiplier for horsepower and thus horsepower is going to be increasing. The same goes if torque starts falling off. As you can see on this dyno chart, torque is falling off but horsepower is still increasing and this is going to happen as long as torque doesn't fall off too sharply because again, although torque is falling off, the RPMs are increasing and we're multiplying the torque by the RPMs, thus increasing the horsepower value. And now the final question, level three, the boss question. Nah, not really, it's not hard, just something you might be curious about. Uh, and the question is, uh, why do torque and horsepower eventually start falling off? Why do they reach a peak and then fall off? If the piston is moving faster and faster as the RPMs increase, shouldn't torque just keep increasing until the RPM limit if we're, you know, getting more and more air into the engine? Well, the answer behind this is that it would be stupid and useless to have peak torque occur near the RPM limit. You may indeed see that some racing engines do have peak torque pretty close to the RPM limit, but a racing engine spends most of its very short life being revved all the, all the time to the RPM limit and driven all out. Uh, other engines that, that see a very wide variety of uses, so you need to join on the highway, stay on the highway, you drive to curvy back roads, drive to city traffic, in this case, you really don't want to be forced to rev to the red line all the time to get the vehicle moving. You need torque to get the vehicle moving and you want the torque to be somewhere reasonable so you can access this peak torque relatively easily. This means that the location of peak torque is calibrated for the engine's intended use. And it's calibrated predominantly by the size of the intake valves and the throttle body. As we said, the intake valves and the throttle body determine the potential air, the maximum potential air that can get into the engine. And the piston speed, the vacuum generated by the pistons, determines how much of that air actually gets in but how much air within the maximum potential determined by the intake valves and the throttle body. So the size of your inlet devices is a limiting factor to how much air can get in. Because at a certain point, the speed of the piston is going to try to ingest more air 
then can actually come through the intake valves and the throttle body. At this point, when the piston becomes too fast and tries to suck in too much air, we have reached the maximum possible flow of uh, the size, the diameter of our orifice, which is the throttle body and the intake valves. If you install a very large throttle body and very large intake valves onto your engine, you are creating potential for a lot of air to come into your engine. But to realize this potential, you need a lot of piston speed to actually ingest the maximum amount of air that the large throttle body and intake valves can provide. This means that you need to rev high to realize this potential. So your ultimate power, your maximum power will increase with a larger throttle body and larger intake valves, but your peak torque will be moved higher up and you will need to rev higher to actually generate this power that has been allowed by the larger throttle body and intake valves. But even with a larger intake valve and throttle bodies, at some point your piston speed can become too high and try to ingest more air than our orifices allow. At this point we have reached the maximum mass flow rate through our orifices and now they're becoming a restriction choking the engine. Revving higher and increasing piston speeds higher beyond the maximum amount of air that can come into the engine will obviously not result in a torque increase. Instead, the torque is going to start falling off. And what about electric cars? Why does their torque start falling off? If they have an electric motor and a constant supply of energy from the batteries, why isn't the torque curve just flat all the time throughout the entire RPM range? Well, the answer is back EMF or a back electromotive force. Basically, it's a force that opposes the changing current which induced it. In other words, it's a voltage fighting another voltage. The faster the motor spins, the higher the back EMF, which counters the motor and reduces the torque output. Now, when it comes to the instant torque of electric vehicles, this is often presented as an advantage over internal combustion uh, vehicles. And although it definitely is in situations like city driving, uh, on a different type of road, it really isn't an advantage uh, because having to build power to reach peak power and peak torque isn't necessarily a bad thing. For many, it leads to a, it leads to a more rewarding, more involved, more focused driving experience. And actually, very few things are absolutely, you know, advan advantageous or disadvantageous, and many have merits depending on different conditions and there you have it that's pretty much it when it comes to this video uh, a bunch of uh, you know obvious questions but maybe not so obvious answers in case you didn't have a firm grasp on all these things already as always thanks all for watching i hope seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the d4h